Tonight, a TV that might be too smart, Apple's new streaming service, and one man who destroys iPhones for your enjoyment. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 271 for Monday, February 9th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great tasting snacks right to your door. Start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious options like apple cinnamon crave. To get your complimentary NatureBox sampler, visit naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the top tech stories of the day, at least according to me. Now, I love the idea of a smart TV, but does it also have to be nosy? Samsung's smart TVs include voice recognition options that allow users to control their television with voice commands. Buried deep within the company's privacy policy, however, it says, please be aware that if your spoken words include personal or other sensitive information, that information will be among the data captured and transmitted to a third party. After this information spread on Reddit, The Daily Beast, and The Guardian, Samsung was quick to point out that those third parties are not advertisers, but services that will use the information to improve the voice recognition technology. Siri, Hey Google, and Amazon's Echo did not return my phone calls for this story. New York's Financial Services Department says that in the wake of the recent Anthem health insurance hack, a wave of phishing emails has already begun to hit some of the 80 million people whose personal information was exposed. The phishing emails vary in content and delivery and proper grammar, but some are designed to prey on the very fear of being a victim of the hack. Many emails reportedly offer victims access to free credit monitoring like Target did after they were hacked and encourages unsuspecting users to click on links that are malicious themselves. A spokesperson from Anthem says the company hasn't even begun to contact their customers. And when they do, it will not be through email or phone, but by good old fashioned mail or through a voice coming out of their televisions. I'm just kidding about that last part. Today, Twitter released their twice yearly transparency report that includes government requests for account information, government requests for content removal, and DMCA takedown and counter notices. The report still doesn't list secret orders that Twitter receives from the NSA and other U.S. intelligence agencies because they're not allowed to. You'll remember that last year, Twitter filed a lawsuit in federal court seeking to provide more detail about the data requests the company received from government officials. Now, according to today's transparency report, government requests for specific user account information has increased over 40% since the company's last transparency report in July 2014. But Twitter says the requests affect only a millionth of 1% of users, so your tweets about whether the Grammy should have gone to Beck or Beyonce are probably safe. Now, there's a lot of iOS news today. First, there's the beta of iOS 8.3 that contains support for wireless CarPlay. Then there were the rumors that Apple will focus on performance and bug fixes in iOS 9 instead of introducing a ton of new features. And finally, there was the news out of 9to5Mac that Apple is set to launch a new paid streaming media service. The new service will allegedly integrate Beats Music, the service Apple acquired last year. Katie Benner, columnist from Bloomberg View, reported today on what this means for Spotify and other services. And we've invited Katie to talk to us about it today. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. So what do we know about this service? Well, we actually know very little about the service. Everything that was reported on 9to5Mac, though I will say that they do tend to get their Apple rumors right. Everything that was reported on 9to5Mac is still speculation, but that it's they're going to that Apple will roll out a product that integrates all the technology from Beats with a lot of the music that iTunes already has and integrate that with iOS and iTunes and it would make make it available on both Android and iOS operating systems. So clearly, if this is all true, Apple wants reach more than anything else if they're not going to keep it just on, you know, iPhone, iPad, etc. And then also the streaming service would be cheaper than what we have now. I think $9.99 is pretty much the standard for Spotify and other streaming services that exist, even though Spotify is the leader. And Apple would undercut that price to $7.99, which would also give it sort of uh, an edge, a pricing edge, if it wants to reach as many customers as possible. So now, do, does Apple need to make money from this service? I mean, it's kind of a silly question. They obviously don't make money. <laughs> but, but is that why Absolutely they're doing not. this? 
<laughs> yeah, I don't think that this is something they're doing because they really need to be to to make a profit on the service. I mean, this is a company that has I think 178 billion dollars in cash, give or take a couple billion here or there. Uh, a lot of it's overseas, but what is in the U.S. is still a lot of money. They're wildly profitable. They're the margins on their hardware are greater than pretty much any other hardware company out there. So they can use music as a loss leader, as a way to keep people into the ecosystem of Apple products. It's the, the uh, idea would be, well, if this works so well, just like iTunes, you know, this works so well, it's so easy for me to buy my music and my movies on this. Why wouldn't I also buy them on an iPhone or an iPad? Which is sort of what has happened. It has created a very nice, tight ecosystem for entertainment. Right. So now how would, from what we know, do we know how this might be different than Spotify or RDO or services like that? We actually don't. And I think that one of the things people will be watching really closely is what kind of deals Apple's able to nail down with with the record labels. You know, right now, Spotify has worked really, really hard to get uh to work out deals with all of the major labels. And a lot of those companies actually own equity in Spotify, they're investors. Uh, we'll see what Apple does. Apple has pre-existing relationships with the labels, of course, which it worked out over many difficult, arduous years when it was putting together the iTunes suite of software. And then they have people, you know, people believe that Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine are sort of secret weapons in negotiations with artists and labels, uh, so much so that some people wonder if Apple could someday produce its own music and just cut the record labels out altogether. I would say that's probably pretty far off, though. Mm -hmm. So, is there any chance that recording artists themselves will get better deals out of Apple service? See, that's sort of again. This is something that we don't know, but that would be an interesting thing for Apple to try to offer if it were trying to uh, work directly with artists, because uh, they could say instead of going through the record label, as we know, the money that flows from Spotify to the music industry. I think more than 70% of that goes to the labels. The artists get very, very little. If Apple were to be able to say, listen, why don't you just produce a record for us, for Apple, uh, we can give you a huge cut of the, of the proceeds. That would be a more tempting offer. So that would be one way that people wonder if Apple could get more artists, better artists, more original music, and make itself a more appealing streaming service. But again, this is all in the realm of speculation because all that's in the nine to five Mac report is the idea that Apple is going to go wholeheartedly into streaming music. And so when Apple is about to actually release something, do they often go, I mean, do, do you said before that nine to five Mac has, is, has their rumors are usually true. Is that kind of what they do to just feel out the, the market and see what's happening? I mean, that's certainly the perception is that there are strategic leaks, but I don't think I, you know, I, I certainly haven't confirmed that with Apple, but that's, that's certainly the perception. And I think that people are genuinely excited about the idea of Apple doing streaming music. It's, if you look at Spotify, Spotify largely um, mimics the iTunes design anyway. It's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people were comfortable using Spotify is because it was familiar to us. And so if Apple can create a product that is a feature of iTunes that's just as easy to use and just as convenient, that would be great because we already have it, we already use it, and then it could have a downloading component, a streaming component, and uh, a really great catalog. I mean, that's the dream, right? That's what we want. So people are people are very, very excited. Right. Well, you say in your article that, um, that services like Spotify are actually hard to scale, that the bigger they get, the harder they are to run. Um, but that won't be the case from what we know from this service. Right. And I think that one of the things that people talk about when they talk about um, questions around Spotify is that they, it doesn't run like a traditional software company where you create the software and then it just goes on to lots and lots of devices and it's a huge margin, like 90% margins. And every time a widget is sold, you don't have to do any more work. So it's very scalable, very profitable business. That's traditionally what software is. Spotify is somewhere is a little bit different than that. Basically, a fixed portion of its total revenue is spent on royalties. So if Spotify doubles its subscriber base, it actually doubles the amount of money it has to pay out. So unless it reaches a huge scale, it's going to be difficult for it to ever be profitable. And so it's one thing for a company like Apple to have a business that breaks even or is never quite profitable. It's another thing for a startup that has taken a lot of venture money to run like that for, you know, months and months and years and years. Right. So another thing that you uh, were reporting today in your tech roundup was uh, a story in Wired 
about how more and more techies are homeschooling their kids. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, were you surprised by that? Did that? I wasn't. I have um, three children, <laughs> and uh, school is kind of broken in a lot of ways. I uh, I've actually talked to my kids about homeschooling. One of my my nine year olds said um, that he might want to be home, homeschooled after he graduated from college, which led me to believe that he didn't really understand what homeschooling was. <laughs> um, but I, you know, it's, I, it's, it's like a start, you know, it's the school startup. That's the way I see it. Um, were you surprised by it? I mean, yes and no. I think that, uh, I think I was, I, I think it's, it's part of a larger trend that we see with technology wanting to remake a lot of the social institutions that we have today, including education to be more efficient and better run. So in that way, it's not surprising, but the idea that people would discount altogether um, sort of the, the social good that comes with being in school. When I say that, what I mean is the way that it forces you for better or worse to learn, to get along with and relate to and, uh, integrate with people who are not like you and who come from all walks of life and have all sorts of different ideas and who have all sorts of skills, skill levels, ability levels, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Like these are real skills that I think allow people to function well in the real world. And um, again, is it surprising that people who work in technology would not find these things to be important even a little bit? Uh, (laughs) Probably not. But when you think about this as an industry that is starting to produce more and more leaders of really important companies, um, that is something that I think people are starting to think about a little bit more in terms of where does tech fall on the, uh, are we part of society or are we not part of society scale? Are we part of these rules and regulations? Are we part of these social codes? Do we believe that, um, you know, this is the way the world has to run for better or worse tech often says no. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is interesting because it's true. Like, you know, homeschooling is rarely done by them, themselves, like at home anymore, because it's so easy to connect. You have these homeschooling groups, but you're exactly right that they tend to be like-minded people, which is very similar to the way startups and Silicon Valley works. You know, it's all, you know, a lot of people right. that, that look and think the same, which is not necessarily good for society. So then you get these product bubbles, right? Where people say, wait, why, why wouldn't everybody want, you know, Washio or whatever, you know, these startups that seem like a really great idea in this ecosystem because they are, uh, in a wider community of people who who are not all the same, some of these ideas don't work. Right. Well, what else are you working on, Katie? Oh, my goodness. Working on a lot of stories right now, running down some interesting startup news, always doing my daily tech reads. And later in the week, we will have some interesting news coming out of uh, an event that involves uh, Sony. So that will be really fascinating. So stay tuned for that. It should <laughs> It should land on Thursday. Well, thank you so much. That's Katie Benner. She's the columnist at Bloomberg View. And where's the best pe- place for people to catch up with you? The best place is BloombergView.com or uh, easily reach on Twitter, KT Benner, K-T-B-E-N-N-E-R. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Coming up why you might want to pass on the Apple Watch or drop out of college, and what happens when an iPhone 6 meets a bubbly vat of Coca-Cola. But first, this episode is brought to you by NatureBox. Right now, NatureBox is giving you a chance to get a complimentary trial box of their most popular snacks and just pay $2 for shipping. Life is hectic and it's hard to make the best snacking choices. When you're looking for a quick pick-me-up, reach for delicious, healthy snacks at naturebox.com. NatureBox has hundreds of delicious, nutritionist-approved snacks. Stop wasting your life away reading labels. I will tell you that NatureBox snacks have zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams trans fat, and no high fructose corn syrup. So in the afternoon when you're hungry, do what I do. Grab Asiago and cheddar cheese crisps or dark, dark cocoa almonds or cinnamon swirl kettle kernels or grab all of them, which is often what I do. If you know you're going to snack, get smart about it with NatureBox. Start your trial today and get a complimentary sampler box at naturebox.com slash twit. Stay full, stay strong, start snacking smarter. Go to naturebox.com slash twit, and we thank NatureBox for their support of Tech News Tonight. And now on to a few more stories we're following today. 
oh, Apple Watch, you're still at least a month away and already you're changing everything. Slash Gear reports that several universities in the UK have already banned the Apple Watch in college classrooms for fear that students will use them to cheat. Many colleges have not just banned the Apple Watch, but all smartwatches, many of which are already on the market, in case you didn't know. Some classrooms have even banned all watches because it's hard to tell which are smart and which are dumb. For example, I bet you had no idea that this was a Timex that I got for $19.99 at Target. You, you know what it's smart at tell, enough to tell me? That it's time for me to get a new watch. Netflix has officially launched in Cuba, where less than 5% of the population has internet access, and the average monthly salary is $20 a month, which is almost double Netflix monthly subscription cost. This comes, of course, as a result of the U.S. normalizing relationships with, with Cuba, Cuba and is essentially a PR stunt and an effort on Netflix's part to prove that they can battle streaming giants like Amazon and Google. Qualcomm settles an antitrust probe in China today by agreeing to pay a $975 million fine and to make other changes. The deal holds Qualcomm to new licensing terms for 3G and 4G related patents. Also, Qualcomm will now earn royalties on just 64% of the selling price of patent licensing rather than the full price. The company also agreed to modify contracts for Chinese companies buying chips in order to adhere to terms Chinese regulators say are unfair. The changes affect mostly products both made and sold in China. And finally, a warning about something that you would never accidentally do and you would probably never willingly do unless you were desperate for YouTube views and a spot on our show. Please don't boil your iPhone 6 in Coca-Cola. This video comes from YouTuber Tech Racks, whose most popular productions include what happens if you taser an iPhone 6 Plus and how to properly grind an iPhone. He's also known for such famous taglines as, yellow smoke, we meet again. Now, please don't boil an iPhone in Coke. It does not, it's not good. It's gross. It dissolves. And uh, please, please don't try this at home or anywhere else. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.